I'm Melissa Salron, and I'm here with Rachel Woody, and we're interviewing Vicki and Casey McClellan at Seven Hills Winery on July 15th, 2014. So the first question is perhaps obvious, but why wine? Well, it's, a, <laughs> it's an agricultural product. Uh, it's an interesting business. Uh, Vicki and I were getting more and more interested in wine when we were younger, drinking more wine, um, touring around wine regions um, after we got out of the University of Washington, and uh, fit right in with a return to Walla Walla and uh, uh, a, uh, for America, kind of exciting new angle on agriculture. I know sometimes winemakers explicitly choose to establish themselves in regions known for winemaking already, or they know the soil is good, the climate is good, um, and other people take a different path. So can you tell us a little bit about how you ended up here in the Walla Walla Valley making wine? Well, I grew up here, and I dragged Vicki over here from the west side of the Washington state. Um, but my family had been in eastern Washington since the 1880s, and um, the approach here was, uh, you know, the founding uh, generation, my father and his business partner and their wives, um, they liked wine. They'd been in farming growing up and they thought, well, we can grow great wine grapes here. And that's really all it was, was a vision. There was not a lot of data to support that. And this is Dr. James McClellan, your father, and Dr. Herb Hendricks. Yes. Okay, and so they, they both, I mean, did they, did they experiment with, with orchards as well, or was it they went straight to, to growing grapes? They had also planted orchards uh, more from, you know, a, a commodity or, you know, productive crop that was proven, because the orchard business was certainly proven here since the late 1800s. Uh, and grapes have been growing in a small way over the years, historically, but as far as Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot, um, a little bit more of a visionary jump. Well, both um, Dr. Hendricks and Dr. McClellan were from farming families, um, uh, and they both left agriculture for medicine thinking that they would never return. And um, it was in the 70s that they both decided, well, you know, no, that, that's a really big part of us. We want to go back to that. But I think both of them had been from grain growing families yes. primarily. Yeah. And I don't know that they were necessarily interested in going back into that. I think the, you know, the orchards held more um, allure for them. And then um, the two of them as a, um, as a team were, you know, men that had, you know, just one good idea after the next. And so they were um, very close friends and they were schemers and there was just, um, when they got an idea in their head, there was just no stopping them. And, um, you know, this isn't particularly wine related, but, you know, in, in terms of the uh, medical community here in Walla Walla, they were both really visionaries for um, St. Mary Medical Center too and really, um, and were very, very active in making that, you know, kind of the, the regional care center that it is today. So it wasn't, they were visionaries in a very broad right. sense. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, I think, yeah. Sorry. And I was gonna say, and and you know, men with a great sense of humor too. They were, they were very funny, about that's, their adventures. That's great. Yeah. I mean, did, did everyone kind of say, oh, what are they doing, growing grapes? Is that? Well, certainly the community at large said that, and the <laughs> the other the other farmers said that because it was a it's a very strange thing to do to, especially to plant Bordeaux red varietals. Uh, in this area when the conceived wisdom was that this was going to be like Germany, you know, white, you know, Germanic varietals. Right, because at the time, Riesling was the most broadly planted yeah. grape in, this, in, in Washington state anyway. Okay. Yeah. So they just did a lot of research and said, no, we think that this will work too. And that's what they did. And I know, so you, you helped them plant um, in 1982. The yeah, the old, the old Merlot block, yes. Okay. Yeah. Hot day in June, 100 degrees. <laughs> Plants survived though. Wow. And, and Vicki, were you, you were not yet here because... No, I was here, um, I was here that summer because, um, you know, I was, I was wildly in love with my boyfriend and, um, and I had gotten a job driving P combine. Um, so Casey basically worked um, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and I worked 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. because I drove the night shift for D&K. 
but I would go, um, you know, out to the vineyard during the day because, you know, that was my only chance to, you know, that was our only chance to spend any time together. And then on the days that I was off from driving, I would, um, you know, work out there with them. But I think I told you earlier, Walla Walla in the early 80s was not, you know, the charming, picturesque town that it is now. In fact, you know, I ma made a mental note that I would never live here. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I did lobby strongly for, um, for when, we, when we were kind of scheming about where our winery would be, um, to be one of the Puget Sound wineries. You know, because the industry was, was just starting up there too. There were some, um, you know, great wineries that were located around the Woodenville area and then, you know, on the islands off of um, Seattle and modern transportation makes it possible for you to, you know, make great wine, you know, a hundred or more miles from where your um, fruit is being grown. So I have to say it, it took me um, a little while to get on board with the We Must Live in Walla Walla plan, but Casey felt very, very strongly that, you know, if we were going to do it, he wanted to live where the grapes were being grown. So here we are. <laughs> So I know Seven Hills was bonded in 1988, and you opened the winery in Oregon in 1989. Um, so what was it like starting a winery at that time? Um, do you want um, more, do you want any factual corrections yeah, yeah, to what you say? Please. Okay, <laughs> so our, our beginnings were a little complex. Right. Um, the, the, the two doctors and their wives started the winery in 87 and they worked with Waterbrook on the Washington side of the border so we custom crushed there in 1987. We have a, a 1987 white vintage um, so that was our first vintage that was before Vicki and I came back. Okay. So Vicki and I came back in 88 and our second harvest was the first red vintage you know Cabernet and Merlot so that was produced at Waterbrook Winery so for the first two years we were washing winery uh, in January of 89, we launched the new company uh, with Vicki and I involved and uh, moved the winery to Oregon. And so the 89 vintage uh, was, that's when we became bonded in Oregon and an Oregon winery. Uh, but the 88s are still produced and bottled by in Oregon. Yes. Because we moved them involved. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they were released out of the Oregon winery, but we started making them in Washington. So, okay. Okay, thank uh, you for that yeah, and we are we are probably the Oregon, the only winery ever that began in Washington, moved to Oregon, then moved back to Washington. But, but we can do it because we're in the Walla Walla Valley, you know. Yeah, I mean, none of our moves were more than ten miles. Uh -huh. yeah. It just, you know, yeah. the state line is there. So that's a convoluted answer to uh, <laughs> like, but uh, since it's historically wise, we'll right. No, you know. that's right. Well, I, um, <laughs> So, and what, what roles were each of you playing during this process? Well, we were both kind of making wine and... Yeah, um, it, I mean, we were very, very small. Our first red harvest was just 220 cases. And, um, and yeah, so we were kind of both doing everything. It yeah, was, so we would both go sell wine. Um, yeah. We weren't so much working actually in the vineyard at that point we were more focused on, on the, uh, wine side. the wine side of things because the other the Hendrick side of the family lived out on the farm and so Scott and uh, Scott is uh, Herb and Mary Jane's son farmed out there and then we so we focused on the winemaking and selling the wine yeah so but Casey at that time um, was working full-time as a pharmacist um, and um, when we started the winery, we had um, our, our oldest daughter was one, and we very quickly had two more daughters. So it was a really um, it was a really um, hectic and active time of our of our life. Um, Casey refers to them as the blurry years. Um, <laughs> and uh, but we were small enough that you could that you could kind of you know you could kind of do it in the hours in the hours that you had and um, we were very fortunate the um, the winery in Milton Freewater we started in the old water mill building which was um, you know part of a, a much larger fruit processing consortium they did you know cherries and plums and all sorts apples, of other things yeah. apples um, so there was a, a huge amount of um, of food uh, processing knowledge there, I guess you'd call it for lack of a better word. And they were very generous to us in um, loaning their, you know, equipment and their expertise. And so, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot that's um, said about how the early wineries helped each other out, but really early ag helped us out too. 
you know, Hank Svehog, who um, was the founder of, you know, what is now Key Technology. Mm -hmm. He was just absolutely great at adapting and developing um, equipment for us because certainly with when we were the fifth winery in the valley, there were no vendors coming out to see us. N not like now where, you know, there are, you know, people coming through offering you solutions, you know, you know, on a weekly basis, if not daily, certain times a year. I mean, it was, um, Watermill was extremely helpful to us in, um, in basically setting up our early winery so that, so that we could do it with the, you know, haphazard life that we were leading at the time. But I will say from the beginning, I have always felt like, um, you know, Casey has been our winemaker. It's been his palate that has, you know, that has really set the house style. And um, fortunately, I really like his wines. So, yes. um, <laughs> I know Casey, after you finished your, your um, pharmacy, your studies as a pharmacist, then you went to UC Davis yes. and got your master's in enology there. Yeah. And then yeah. after that, you went to Portugal for a little bit. Yeah, okay, we were there almost a year. Okay. Mm -hmm. And before that, you had been on a bicycling trip through Europe, both of you. Yes, that so, was sort of our wine. That was a that was a wine education. Great. Yeah, yes. that's, that's an amazing way to see any viticultural region. It's. Uh, because you feel the land, you're riding through it, and you're moving through it at 10 to you know 15 miles per hour, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you really feel like you're part of the landscape. And you, it, I think you understand a lot more deeply what the land feels like uh, versus doing a car or a bus tour. Or, well, I think it, that also that um, helped us really shape what kind of winery we wanted to be, what kind of lifestyle we wanted to lead. I mean. Um, where it was very much, um, you know, their farms and their wines were part of their everyday life and they were part of the lives of, of their community. And so, you know, when we decided that, um, you know, that we wanted to be in the wine business, that's very much the style of winery that we were going for. We didn't really, you know, like aspire to be, um, um, I guess, um, you know, uh, a cult winery or a really esoteric winery. I would be much happier. Um, you know, we felt like we would be much happier being a winery that, that you know, was just part of the lives of, of the people that we knew and that you know we lived with, and you know, rather than you know being on the table of, you know, every every celebrity in the mm -hmm. in the region. So, um, and I think that also was um, that that experience and our experience in Portugal. Um, I think also um, really helped in those early years when we were building the winery and everything was so ill-defined because we had seen we had seen so many other ways that that people were making it work you know you could be very flexible then saying okay well maybe this isn't the way that you know that they're doing it over here or they're doing it in this region but this is the way that it's going to work for us so mm -hmm. Definitely, when you when you're in Portugal and you see wine made at facilities that uh, it's a stone hut with a dirt floor with no running water, and like the, I can do the that. wines are amazing. <laughs> and it is you know that that European perspective where wine is a accepted part of daily life, and uh, it doesn't quite have the like the celebrity or the glitzy shine that it does in America, where it's a newer phenomenon. Yeah. So we were at um, in. Event in the Willamette Valley a couple years ago, and um, Diana Lett actually had a great quote where she said something like, "Unencumbered by either excess cash or experience, we just decided to do it this way." <laughs> 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 well, you know, that kind of leads into mm -hmm. the next question, then, Vicky, because I know we were talking earlier about um, how this is such a uh, an agricultural community, wheat, you know, the banks understood how to finance wheat farmers, mm -hmm. but, but it was a different thing. I mean, can you speak a little bit about that, about the challenge of, of working with the banking community to uh, have them understand the differences with the wine industry? You know, I'm wondering if one of these, in one of these boxes of archival materials, if we actually still have some of the old loan forms where they just said, just cross out wheat and write in wine. <laughs> You know, it wasn't even on the forms. <laughs> so it was, um, it was a process of, um, of education. And I think um, Casey's brother, Rory McClellan, who also um, 
you know, he and his wife Rochelle are, are part of the winery also, and um, Rory's expertise really was on that financial side. He's a um, CPA and, um, you know, worked very closely at the time with um, small businesses, and um, he was a real asset to us in being a person who could speak that same financial language as the bank and really advocate for why instead of year and a nine, instead of needing a nine-month operating line, we needed a two-year operating line because you know that was our product cycle. Right. So. Um, we definitely, the wine industry kind of didn't fit into the, um, you know, sort of the pre, you know, kind of the preset um, loan structure that the local banks had. But again, um, you know, people were, were pretty flexible and they wanted to help out. And it took them, you know, it took them a little while to, you know, kind of get that through their system. Um, about 15 years. About 15 years, yeah. But, um, but, I felt like they were they were being as cooperative as they could given the tools that they had at sure. hand. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. By the year, about the turn of the century, around 2000, it seemed like Is when things the community really started like getting into the groove with, they realized that, you know, wine could be good for the community and the banking community finally go, okay, yeah. I mean, the other thing is early on, it's an unproven crop, it's risky right. and... Mm -hmm. You know, loaning to that kind of thing is, you know, more problematic. Mm -hmm. So who, um, who were some of the other early winemakers or, or grape growers in the region? Well, we were the fifth winery, so, um, you know, uh, Gary and Nancy Figgins obviously were, com you know, completely set up and active, Rick and Darcy Small. Um, um, Eric and Janet Rindell were already established. Uh, Marty and Megan actually yeah. moved back to Walla Walla, I think the same year we did, to you know, start helping out Baker and Jean. Mm -hmm. um, Jack um, Durham or Dunham, I can't believe I can't remember his last name, up at Biscuit Ridge. Um, I can't remember if it's Durham or Dunham either. It's either you, you would know his this. Wife. Yeah. yeah. Um, but at, um, at Biscuit Ridge, I mean, he was. Um, uh, I thought a really great early presence in the wine industry, you know, very, um, very free with his knowledge and, um, and uh, just a real advocate for what he thought that could be done here. Patrick Paul, um, Mike Paul, um, the Paul family mm -hmm. is here. Mm -hmm. Nobody on the, nobody else on the Oregon side, though, mm -hmm. I mean. No. No, although I think in the Walla Walla Valley, people don't really pay a lot of attention to the state line. Yeah. You know, you just don't see that. It isn't, it's not an issue here. And we didn't think that it would be, um, you know, we didn't really think that it would be an issue right. either. We thought that the Walla Walla Valley would always be looked at at the Walla Walla Valley, but the further you get away from the Northwest, the more, um, the more, in the, especially in the early years, the more, um, you know, the more difficult that story was because, and, and, and even um, talking about wine from Washington State in people's heads, still even now, when they think Washington, they think, you know, Mount Rainier, Pine Trees, right. the Puget Sound. So um, there still is as much work as we've done, there's still a lot more that can be done in um, letting people know how very different Eastern Washington is right. from the Puget Sound area. Right. Well, I have in my notes that when the ABA was established in 1984, that um, Darcy Fugman Small and Becky Hendricks mm -hmm. and, and Gary Figgins were very involved. And then there was also another note that said the, the um, Hendricks and McClellan families were involved in that process too. Mm -hmm. So were, right. were you involved or was it your father or were both of you involved? Well, Vic, Vicky and I came back in 82 and uh, helped plant that Merlot block and then we left and we did not return um, until June of 88. Oh, okay. So we were not here during the actual birth of the AVA. Right. The uh, seven, original Seven Hills Vineyard was the largest single uh, vineyard in the valley and its existence helped justify the creation of the AVA. Mm -hmm. But that period of time is we were probably not the best historical sources because we were going, we were in Davis, we were in Portugal, and right, um, right. And yeah. it was in 2000 that you moved back to well, I mean, moved from Oregon to want move the winery. Yeah, back we to moved into this building, the White House Crawford building, in May of 2000. Okay. Yeah. 
and you completely renovated the space and I mean, can you say a little bit about this building? Um, well, yeah, briefly, um, you know, this building was built in 1904. It's, um, it was a wood plane mill and furniture manufacturer, I, you know, kind of the, the, really the building that built Walla Walla. Um, and um, it um, was being threatened by uh, demolition. Um, the city had, I, I believe the city had acquired the building um, as part of the parcel when they also acquired the block across the street where the Army Corps of Engineers building is now. Um, and because they wanted to attract the Army Corps of Engineers into downtown Walla Walla as opposed to having them out at the airport. And I guess there were several other sites that the Corps was considering. So anyway, um, so this ended up being basically kind of excess inventory for the city. And so they were looking for an alternate use for it. They were trying to sell it. I mean, they were really trying to figure out what to do with this building that, that you know, was kind of a stone hanging around their neck. Anyway, so um, it was being threatened with demolition. Um, Carl and Sonia Schmidt had recently um, moved back to town, and um, Sonia has a family history with this building, and they felt very strongly about um, saving it and preserving it, and really led the way in um, in making sure that you know that the building remained standing and. Um, and we were introduced to the Schmitz in um, 1999 or 1998. Late 99, yeah. Um, because we were, um, we knew we were growing out of our space in Oregon. And um, so we were looking for another winery building. So um, we, we pitched the idea to them that, um, that um, you know, we would love to move our winery into this building. And they were just incredibly enthusiastic and supportive and um, really instrumental in, Getting, um, getting the city convinced that you could have uh, that a, a building with that new use in the because we are still in the historic downtown core here. Right. So, um, you know, I mean, Carl is a very determined man, and um, and he was just great. He really led the charge for us. And yeah, so. it was a very progressive idea yeah. uh, at that time, and one that the city needed to. It took time for them to wrap their heads around it, and. Uh, um, I think it was a great idea, and I still do, to have this uh, winery integrated into the core of the community. And it's, it's, uh, it reminded Vicki and I of uh, the way things are in France. You're driving through town, mm -hmm. there's a winery and cellar, and uh, it's just you're wrapped into everything else that goes on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, the renovation took... Um, <clears throat> I guess about 11 months. Yeah, I mean, it was really pretty rapidly. amazing. Kettleson Construction um, did the work, and um, I can remember being at a big wine event in Seattle in April, and people actually were stopping by my table saying, I drove by your building last week, no way you're in there in May. <laughs> <laughs> but we opened, you know, we opened the first weekend in May, and th that yeah. last month there was um, a battalion of work people here. I don't yeah. know how they didn't, you know, trip over each other, wow. but you know, they got the work done. Yeah. So that's great. Yeah. Well, I know in um, in 1995 there were 11 wineries in the Walla Walla Valley, and by around now there are about 120. At least, yeah. Yeah, kind of a moving target. It, right. You hear all, yeah. it, you hear everything from 120 to 170, and I right. have no idea what is the correct number. Right. So, what do you, what do you make of these changes? I mean, how, how, um, what does that suggest about the wine industry in Walla Walla and that kind of thing? Well, it's not something that I think either of us ever imagined would happen. I mean, because our, our perspective was coming here in the late 80s and growing up, me growing up here and thinking, you know, maybe there would be a dozen wineries. And, well, even you know. when we moved into this building, in fact, we should try and find this box for Melissa. We did a, um, a list of predictions that we opened in 2010, and we were so wrong. Oh, well, we definitely predicted that the wine industry would double, but I think it more like quadruple. <laughs> yeah, at least, yeah. Yeah, that's the one that I really remember. We predicted how large we would be. We'd gotten bigger than we thought. Um, you know, I mean, it was just really, it, it has been really interesting. I think, you know, in this process that you're doing, some of the people who might be interesting for you to interview are the, um, the kids of the wineries. Yeah. I mean, at one point, um, 
uh, you know, when they were all kind of in elementary and um, grade school, I think they have the really interesting perspective on this just sort of, you know, thing that their family did and, you know, the trips that they would go on and, you know, I mean. Um, well, have any of your, your children gone on to uh, make a future in the wine industry? You know, they're all um, in their 20s now, and I think everybody has to leave before they come yeah. back. Um, and they definitely do events yeah. for us. They are, um, they're great, um, they're, they're great uh, uh, representatives, ambassadors of the right. house. Um, they've all said that they, um, you know, they know how hard the work is. I mean, they certainly wouldn't have any sort of veil of glamour about, right. you know, what would my life be like in the wine industry? So I don't know. It'll be interesting to see, you know, if they do or, uh -huh. you know, if they don't. Uh huh. Yeah. So. Well, how? Um, I mean, I know that the CC established the Center for Enology and Viticulture. Mm -hmm. um, how has that changed things in Walla Walla? Having, having a program like that here? I think it's helped, it's helped develop the, the labor force. It's it raised the technical and you know, mm -hmm. theoretical knowledge of uh, our workforce. And uh, I think it's been good for the Valley as far as helping focus attention on the industry and its growth. And it's been a great resource. Um, I, see, I see real synergy between what they're doing and what the, the industry is doing mm -hmm. so well and when um, when uh, Casey was going back for his master's there wasn't a program in Washington there was um, UC Davis UC Fresno or, or Cornell mm -hmm. um, so it's great that there's you know not only the Walla Walla Community College now in Washington but you know South Seattle's got a program um, WSU has a four-year program so um, it's wonderful to have uh, wine education, you know, in our region. Mm -hmm. So, excellent. Great. So we're going to sort of transition now into more broader ideas of Walla Walla and the Oregon Washington relationship, and thoughts on that for past and present, and where you think it might be in the future. Hmm. And so I'd love to dig in a little bit more because, of course, you were in Oregon for a little bit of time. Um, with the winery and, and some details as to why the strengths and challenges of that and uh, then moving up here and what the differences have been. Okay. I think we can offer a unique perspective on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we, the reason that we originally started in Oregon was because that's where the vineyard is. Um, you know, and we wanted to be close to the vineyard. Um, in practical terms, there was um, the water mill building, which I talked about a little bit about earlier, which was an ideal place for us to start up um, our business because, um, um, you know, there, we wouldn't have the huge capital investment in the building and there was so much expertise there. And really at the time with the Walla Walla Valley being um, established the same year as the Columbia Valley and I believe the Willamette Valley, wasn't that also established earlier. in 84? Yeah. Perhaps one of the first ones, but it was right around early 80s. Yeah, so we, mm. we kind of thought that um, state positioning as we grew as a winery would be, um, you know, would be a non-issue. But, um, you know, the Oregon industry at that time was so heavily, um, so heavily dominated by um, you know, Pinot Noir production that, um, you know, kind of the state really was known or was becoming known for that and the Bordeaux varietals were, um, you know, they were just, um, there was so little recognition of them. Um, so, um, uh, in the early years, it was really challenging from that perspective being an Oregon winery. I mean, if you think of the way that um, wine shops are organized or wine lists are organized or the way the publications are produced, they're produced by state or they're organized by state. So, you know, we would submit to these various things and they would be like, oh, well, you know, we love your wine. Those are great. They're going to come out in the Washington end issue because it really doesn't make sense to put them in Oregon. And then the Washington issue would come out, and the wines wouldn't be in there. And I say, you make the call, and they'd say, "Well, we really couldn't put you in Washington because you're in Oregon." So, um, but then when the Oregon issue came out, it didn't really make sense to put you in there. And um, when you were out of the region pouring wine, you would get the comment that, for example, you know, our Cabernet or Merlot was you know, was, was good for an Oregon version because they don't really do that in Oregon, do they? So there was a lot of, um, 
there was a lot of just that sort of um, you know lack of awareness that Oregon um, could really produce a wide variety of um, wine really you know in in, in a world-class way well it's it, Pinot Noir will always drive the Oregon business. Yeah, because I think it's, it did what, it in the, it's what they make. It did in the past, it does now, and it will in the future. Um, and I think as if you're a non-Pinot or non-Burgundian producer in Oregon, you need to accept that and uh, work with that situation. Um, you know, also, I mean, geographically, even if it just aside from varietal considerations, the weight of the industry is in the Willamette mm -hmm. Valley and we're 240 miles from there. So participation, uh, communication, uh, meeting people as a Milton Freewater Oregon winery all becomes more difficult. Mm -hmm. And I do think, you know, we worked at it and the Oregon Wine Growers Association worked at it, uh, but, you know, as a, also as a tax funded, um, entity, the Oregon Wine Board, you... Their funding is from that region. Yeah, and you need to yeah. respect that and everything else uh, is kind of the the uh, outer circle around that core, which is, I think, a natural and an appropriate thing. So after 11 years of that and this little lonely feeling out here in Eastern Oregon, we said, you know, I think things might be better if we moved 10 miles north across the border again. Uh -huh. So didn't wasn't a decision that came lightly because I'm a native Oregonian, second generation, and uh, I really wanted to be in Oregon winery. And uh, as Vicki said, in the early days, who knew? Who knew what mm -hmm. varietal would rise to the top and you know be what a region was famous for? Or maybe there'd be more than one. But um, so that was kind of the original. You know, feeling and situation back in the early days. Mm -hmm. Even with, um, you know, our original plan was to be um, was to be Walla Walla Valley only. But you know, um, I'm sure you've heard this before. We do have, um, you know, the, those occasional winter kills where it, it makes sense to diversify your fruit base. Which, um, you know, 1989 was a kill year, so it was a great lesson to get very early that we needed to go out and, um, you know, and search for other vineyard locations that we felt, you know, a strong affinity to and that we felt would make really, um, you know, great wines that were a great companion to what we were um, already making. And so um, uh, we started working with some vineyards on um, Red Mountain very early on and, and have gone out to find other sites. But um, at the Washington events, um, they were always very good about letting us pour at their events because we were Walla Walla Valley, which is a bi-state appellation, but they would caution us that we had to pour Washington fruit. So I could stand next to, um, you know, Marty Club and Gary Figgins at, um, you know, Leonetti and LaCole, and they could pour their Seven Hills Vineyards wines, but I would have to pour my Clips and Vineyard wines because, you know, I couldn't be an Oregon winery pouring Oregon fruit and be at a Washington event. I at least needed to pour Washington fruit. Yeah, we need fruit. some sort of connection. So that was yeah. really interesting. In Washington State, we were actually originally known more for our Red Mountain wines than our Walla Walla Valley wines because we couldn't pour the Walla Walla Valley ones at events. I think both states were very cooperative with this because they knew the situation on yeah. the ground was the AVA and that was an extremely rare situation with Appalachians uh, that it be a, a bi-state Appalachian. So everyone kind of worked to make that as good as it could be. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the, the simplifying thing was, let's just move to Washington. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially because this building had become available. You know, I mean, there, this was a very strong, uh, it was a very strong draw. When we first yeah. moved to um, Walla Walla, we actually rented a house that was just maybe four blocks from here, kind of behind where the Kirkman house is, where Safeway is. And, um, and I can remember walking around this area with, um, you know, I had our daughter in a stroller and, um, <clears throat> you know, my mom was with me and, um, and Brickstone Interiors, which was a furniture store, was in the space where the restaurant is now. And so um, my mom and I loved this building so much that we went into the furniture store just basically to see the building. And, um, and when we were talking to the woman and she was telling us that they had more stock in back if we didn't see what we wanted on the floor, we're just like, oh, well, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's see the other dining room tables. 
just to get a glimpse in the back room. So, I mean, this is such a, it's such a beautiful building. This was, like I said, a, very much a magnet for us when we were trying to make that decision. So for Oregon and Washington, the sense that I've gotten, especially being here a couple days now, is everyone on the ground who's this, it's Walla Walla AVA, Walla Walla Valley, mm -hmm. that's the identity. It doesn't matter Oregon, Washington. True. Do you think that'll ever translate or transcend into Oregon, Washington, the politics business side to make it easier for wineries to be in Oregon and in Walla Walla and and not have the, the struggles or the challenges that you guys did. Do you think that hmm. would change or get better? Um, I think that if we weren't all making alcohol, yes. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I think a big part of it is the tax structure of both states. Um, Good point. If I we were really growing. Think that's the largest part of it. <laughs> if we were growing just fruit, it would be simpler. But not only do you have the states involved with their alcohol regulatory structures, which are very peculiar to each, you have the federal situation where that set of regulations also decides what you can and can't say on a label. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to get three entities. To agree on you know it changes to to make things a little more smoothly flowing I mean it could happen I, yeah I think out in the marketplace like when we travel nationally for the winery I think that um, I think that that idea is um, uh, people are understanding it better um, but I think that there's still you know there's still a lot of work to do um, I think what um, I mean, we, we who live here are not as um, concerned about sort of the distances um, where, um, you know, I mean, from the Walla Walla Valley to, say, the Willamette Valley, that's a solid four hours on the road. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so I think when you, um, when, you, when you get out of the Northwest and you're, and you're out talking to people in other states, they are still trying to wrap their head around, um, you know, your states are big enough that you can drive for four hours and still be in the same state. You know, a large, a large part of our nation, the states just aren't that big. You drive four hours and you've actually traveled three states. Right. So. Yeah, I think the, uh, the more interesting idea for a winery is, can you create a brand that transcends that conversation, mm -hmm. like Cayuse has done, where they are more than anything else their own entity and it doesn't matter literally it just doesn't matter that brand whether it's on the Oregon side which it is or the Washington side uh, he goes and represents terroir and you know that was our original concept with Seven Hills Vineyard uh, that you know it would be its own place and you would kind of transcend that conversation of mm -hmm. what state it was in but uh, that didn't happen, at least in the past, but it could happen in the future. Yeah, I think um, even for southeastern Washington, northeastern Oregon, because um, you know, there's such a strong sort of pioneer history here, I think, um, you know, I've sat on um, a couple of different tourism boards, and I think that there is, I think that there are efforts afoot to get people to, um, to think about um, the region as um, you know, as a region and not a s one state or the other. I mean, kind of more um, like when we were the Northwest Territories, when we were, you know, Oregon, Washington, mm. and Idaho. Yeah, historical precedent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there has been, as I'm sure you've heard in, in, uh, from others in the Oregon industry and the Washington industry, I think I would and I operate in both states. I really, you know, we have a footprint in both states and always have. Uh, but my experience working with the Oregon industry is there's a little more outreach from that side of the state line north to say, let's do more together. Uh, let's do joint tourism things. Let's do joint research. Let's construct a joint uh, you know, marketing effort when we're overseas. So there's been uh, some cooperation amongst those fields that might give you some indication that someday maybe this will become more cohesive as mm -hmm. a region. It's exciting, good to see. 
You may not know the answer to this question, but um, for like the Seven Hills Vineyards um, with Gary Figgins and um, Ronnie Club, so they're, they're Washington based, but the vineyards are in Oregon. How often does that happen? Is that pretty, pretty normal or pretty based on It's the, very normal. Yeah. Yeah. But for Walla Walla particularly, I think once you get out of the Walla Walla ABA and you go into the Columbia Basin wineries, mm -hmm. it's much less common. Uh, but here, there's a lot of interchange back mm -hmm. and forth. And historically also, uh, as the two communities and the farming across the, the, the valley as it goes across the state line. So it's just kind of an accepted part of the way we do things here. Mm -hmm. Do you find that the, the grapes or the varieties just a little bit different, Oregon versus Washington, even though it's close? I've gotten some different answers with that question, which is why I asked. And, yeah, well, that's a, it's a very broad question. Yeah. Uh, it, <clears throat> it just depends mostly on you know, soil type, orientation, elevation. Right. Uh, I don't know that there's, say, for instance, if you're saying, well, is there a stylistic difference amongst wineries on the Oregon and the Washington side of the AVA? I don't think you can make a statement like that, I mean, is I my think, opinion. I yeah. think that you could say, on if you're just looking at the Washington side, there's a huge difference between, um, you know, say Woodward Canyon's vineyard, which is to the far west of the valley, and those vineyards that are, you know, backed up into the Blue Mountains. I mean, and yeah. that's, you know, that's an east-west thing, not a north-south. Right. But it's because of, um, you know, there's more rainfall up toward the mountains. It's a different set of soil types. Mm -hmm. um, Actually, what we all love to point out is that the Willamette Valley is actually growing on Washington soil because, you know, it all came out on the flood. <laughs> yeah, there's that, er, there's that big erratic in Yamhill County, uh, I think just south of Dundee where you drive by, you're on the way to McMinnville, and there's this, like, large rock that floated down through here. Okay? <laughs> That's a Washington rock there. Although the people from Montana will point out to us that actually we're probably all growing stuff on yeah. Montana soil. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you know, it's interesting. The, the Walla Walla Valley really is like a hybridized entity between the two states. And to a lesser extent, because they're younger, perhaps Columbia Gorge AVA, and to an even lesser extent, the Columbia Valley AVA, which is also by state, but nobody really talks about that at all. But mm -hmm. The Columbia Gorge AVA is probably the best other example of what might happen. It's a much smaller industry. Um, but uh, I think it's interesting across the state lines, the business structure, the regulatory structure differences between those two, two states, mm -hmm. what's allowed and what that gradual, that subtle underneath influence from those structures um, and the marketing boards, um, what influence that will have with more time on the you know, market persona and the operational um, choices that wineries make on either side of the state line. That's actually a kind of a, that'd be an interesting thing to try and figure out is, okay, what, what is really the effect of that under underpinnings of the business? So are you talking about like um, Oregon's income, you know, tax, income tax, tax structure? Tax structure, um, you know, agricultural extension services, mm -hmm. uh, the whole panorama, uh, Oregon Marketing Board, Wine Board versus Washington Wine Commission, all these things kind of add up to a, a presentation of, that goes way beyond the winery style and the, the fruit sourcing. Um, it's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and we definitely have seen that development in um, in uh, you know the um, the state ent entity produced maps and brochures, where for um, the longest time the Oregon map ended at the Cascade Mountains. Even even though we were there, we were there. But you can see why they weren't gonna. I mean, they're not gonna completely reset the map because there's one winery producing you know <laughs> 600 cases, 200 miles from everyone else. So you can understand that. But. Um, even on the um, Washington map, you know, the Columbia Valley also dips significantly into Oregon, you know, as does the Walla Walla Valley. And um, there was an era where, um, where the Washington map stopped at the Washington um, state line, which, you know, was always kind of funny. <laughs> right. 
But you know, again, it's because the NAVA is a federal designation, not a, you know, not a state. But progress, progress I is definitely progress occurring is over the made. years. I will say that. Yeah. That, uh, things are trending in the right direction with that. Yeah. I mean, there was a nice article that came out. Um, I'm thinking one in particular that came out um, in the Wine Spectator a couple years ago, where it was um, basically five days of touring in the Northwest, and you kind of did a big U shape where you started in Seattle and came out to the Walla Walla Valley and then went back through the Willamette Valley. So, I mean, that was. I thought that was a really great thing that, you know, that there was getting to be some national coverage on how you could do, you could do a great, you know, multiple day wine tour and see two different states and, you know, taste wines that were, um, uh, you know, Bordeaux style, Rhone style, Burgundian, you know, and all sorts of, you know, crazy niche varietals in between. I mean, I think that's one of the really interesting things about, um, Washington and Oregon. I mean, if you go to um, you know, if you go to the Napa Valley, you can be um, pretty certain about what varieties they're going to pour in most tasting rooms. You know, you come to Washington and Oregon, every tasting room you walk into can have a completely different set of varietals. I mean, we're just much more um, Washington, especially viticulturally yeah. diverse. Yeah, especially yeah. Washington, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So. So we know that this area is known for Bordeaux. Um, for those types of wines. What would you say the identity is overall? You know, there's the agricultural background sort of underpinning this. Um, when people start thinking Walla Walla Valley, and especially for wine, what is that identity to you? You what we what we think it is, or what do we think they other think people it think it is? is. <laughs> well, both are very different. <laughs> well, I think what other people think is Cabernet Syrah, probably, and Merlot's down there a little lower, and mm -hmm. any white is way lower. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it is. It does. It happens very, very seldom that we will have people come into the tasting room and, you know, ask if we have um, a Pinot Noir or, you know, I mean, people. It seems like once they get here, they're they're pretty well. They're pretty well. Um, you know, pre-educated. Yeah, they know what they're looking yeah. for. Uh, and for Vicky and I and for Seven Hills Winery, it's always been Cabernet from mm -hmm. the start is, you know, the, that's the soul of our business. And uh, I think the region grows a distinctive uh, style of Cabernet that adds mm -hmm. something to the region and the world and, you know, the, you know, the national wine scene. It's competitive on a world stage. Uh, and, uh, you know, the other things kind of float around the edge of that, like Merlot, some of the niche uh, Bordeaux varietals that we're doing, Malbec, Petit Verdot, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't see that changing, really. Rhones have a significant presence here. Uh, but for us and for the region, I think people always think, Walla Walla, and they'll go Cabernet and Syrah. Mm -hmm. um, Excellent. So, sort of transitioning to the conclusion now for you two, um, what are some things that you've learned, or if there were things you could do differently? Uh, we'd love to get your thoughts on that. Like, if you were to give advice to a newly entering winemaker or person into the industry. Wow. <laughs> Start with a lot more money. <laughs> well, and of course you have to be well armed with patience also. You yeah. know, it is not, uh, um, it's, it is not a, a business where things, you know, happen really, really quickly. I mean, you, kind of, you, you really have to be a person who kind of enjoys the journey. Um, yeah. You know, I don't know. I mean, what would we have done differently? I mean, there are things that we could have done differently that would, um, that maybe would have put us in a different position, but I, don't, I still don't know that I would have done them differently. I mean, we made the, we made the um, choice where we started our family the same time that we started our business. I mean, I certainly could have been on the road a lot more when our children were young, but it didn't seem like it didn't seem like a good idea at the time. And um, and you know, I don't know that I, I I still don't know that I would have done it differently. You know, I, those were um, those were very happy years for our family and. Um, 
for our yeah. kids. And it's interesting, you know, I mean, I really felt like they were dragged around so much to all kinds of, you know, okay, we're at a restaurant now. You sit in these chairs. I just need to go talk to these people and pour them some wine. I mean, this the stuff that they, you know, that they would do. And, um, you know, when you had to go to the bank and, you know, I mean, all this stuff, they were just kind of part of it. We'd go into a wine shop. They were great label spotters. You know, they'd be like, oh, there's ours. <laughs> you know, they knew all the Walla Walla Valley ones. So, I mean, they definitely have an interesting um, take on the building at, or on the business. and. Um, uh, when our, our daughter Maeve um, got married um, last Memorial Day and when she said that she wanted to get uh, married out at the farm we just kind of thought okay so they didn't hate that place that was good <laughs> you know that yeah. they have they have very fond memories of um, you know the other thing was is you know you yeah. do um, when you travel in this business you typically stay at, at, at places where you want them to pour your product or whatever and <clears throat> I just don't think they stayed in a cheap hotel until they had to, you know, pay for it themselves. Yeah. <laughs> they have a very distorted perspective of <laughs> dining and lodging, I think. But, but I think the, uh, you know, the, the, the pathway <clears throat> we took, um, it had integrity. It, it, it followed the context of the times yes, and, it did. you know, in hindsight, you it's uh, easy to write revisionist histories, but um, I think you look at it and go, okay, well that, what we did make sense as a path. Right. I mean, I definitely uh, would advise people to be well capitalized going into this business and not make your lives unnecessarily difficult, but uh, there's so much more knowledge available today. Mm -hmm. uh, you can benefit from the you know 20 to 30 years of what's gone before you if you're coming into this valley now. Mm -hmm. And so you do things, you know, you make a lot of mistakes and you learn a lot as you go because there's no, uh, there's no ready answer that's already been produced for you. But um, Vicki's comment about patience is a very good one too. It's just, that's what I see people coming in this from other walks of life as a second career or something is the, uh, it just takes time. And that's mm -hmm. the beauty of wine, but also you have to get into that pace. And Well, I think the other thing also, um, and I guess this speaks to Casey's comment about, um, you know, following the, the, you know, following the path of, of um, you know, integrity of the house, where we have always, um, uh, you know, the winemaking decisions have always come first. We've always been, uh, um, we've always been driven by making, um, the best wine we can and and you know if in those years um, you know you had to make less wine to make the best wine then that's what you need to do is you know make less so excellent all good advice yeah it's been it's been a great place to be in the business for three decades now yeah yeah time flies yes <laughs> Well, between Melissa and myself, mm. is there anything that we should have asked you that we didn't, or mm. any parting thoughts before we wrap up? Well, I think we were very thorough. I think something, and maybe you're touching on with other people, and it's not necessarily unique to Seven Hills or anything, but the the community initially with the wine community's interaction with each other and, and then as it turned into the wine alliance how that entity served as a unifying and organizing catalyst I guess for what happened after 2000 so you might notice this plaque up here it's like there were you know it's a great transformative series of discussions where finally we said yes we're going to create this wine alliance, this Walla Walla Valley based entity and uh, before that it all had been very informal, you know, small groups, entertainment yeah, in their definitely, homes. And, yeah, we definitely got yeah. to the point where there were enough wineries that, um, that it was hard to do on a volunteer basis because it took time and, um, you know, you wanted to be inclusive, you wanted everyone to know and um, just I remember trying to put together the first contact list you know which took like you know six weeks just trying to you know get the callbacks get the you know get everybody to confirm that this is how you want to be contacted this is the way you want your information to appear I mean it just um, 
we were definitely a big enough, we were, we, we were a big enough community of wineries that we all agreed that we should, you know, pool resources and, you know, hire somebody to help organize us, so. Yeah, that's an interesting inflection point that I think signaled the, a certain evolutionary stage. Right. What happened here. But, yeah, I mean, I mean, also there's the whole, I guess, kind of a, deeper story, you know, viticulturally, um, what was going on, you know, in the growing of grapes. But, so that could probably at some point bear deeper discussion. Viticulturally, going back as far as like Dr. Clore? And well, yeah, and then the, you know, the, when, you know, Rick was planning his vineyard and we were planning Seven Hills, um, uh, how the, that side of things has changed and evolved too might be an interesting story, not for today, but um, if you're just looking for, yeah, what's the, if there's another phase of this project mm -hmm. and kind of follow that thread a little, uh, because it's the farming part, um, yeah. I mean, the other thing too that take, kind of takes you out of the region, though, is following the thread of uh, where were the wines sold? I mean, who was buying Walla Walla Valley AVA wine, um, and how did that evolve over the years to where it went from I'm selling to Seattle and Portland versus I'm selling in Tokyo, Hong Kong, London, Denmark uh, today? Mm -hmm. So. That's all I got. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, that was fun.